in prayer tonight. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, for this time that we can gather together here, Lord, pray that you would uh, guide us, direct our thoughts, and uh, feed us now with thy word. Let us dig deep into your word so we can know more about you. Amen. All right. So tonight we're, we're going to get through some of this. I doubt we're going to get through to the end because I really want to dive into some Messianic Psalms tonight. And so we're going to look at uh, the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, but we'll, we'll see how the Lord works it when we get there. Um, chapter two starts out talking about the false teachers saying that, uh, you know, coming off of chapter one, where he's talking about the word of God and how God always intended to give us a perfect Bible. That was always got part of God's plan. You see that all throughout the whole thing. And especially verse 19 in chapter one, if you want to look at verse 19 in chapter one, I think we'll start here. It seems where the Lord's putting us. Um, this is, this is Peter talking about in verse 18, he says, and this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. This is where God, the father at the Mount of Transfiguration says, behold, this is my beloved son in whom I well pleased hear ye him. Okay. God, they literally heard God's audible voice coming from the heavens. Okay. Just as clear and probably clearer and bolder than what my voice is here, but they heard that. And then verse 19 says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. So the Bible that you hold in your hands tonight is even a more sure word of prophecy than even hearing God's audible voice. It is more solid, it is more true, it is more real than even hearing the audible voice of God. And that just right there astounds me, that God would love us so much to give us his word perfectly. Um, and you know, to, we won't rehash the entire chapter, but he says that prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. This is verse 21. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So this is how the scripture was given. The Holy Ghost spoke to them in the Old Testament. Hey, welcome. Back from the dead. Uh, we could start calling him Lazarus, right? Uh, he's just been sick for the last couple of days, so... Um, <clears throat> But no, the, uh, the Holy Ghost spoke to those men, and they wrote that thing down. And from that point forward, God promised to keep his word from this generation and forever. All right? In, in, what you're going to find in the King James Bible is their word forever, as one word, isn't in there. Okay? In 1611, when they first translated it, there was more power to that when it was separated. Forever. Ever is an indefinite never-ending period of time, okay? Today, we lump those two. It really started about in the 1920s when that word, those two words started being lumped into one word, forever, okay? Just to give you a little background on the word forever, if you, if you care or interested at all. But uh, God promised that he would keep it from that generation, the generation that he gave it to, and forever. And so for every generation that would come after, his word would, re, would be preserved, Okay. Uh, we could go into the depth of, uh, you know, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. And, and we have in our, in our laps or on this table tonight, that which is perfect. It's the, it's the perfection of the word of God. Um, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Verse two, or chapter 2, verse 1 starts out, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. And so even as there were false prophets in the old days, when men of God were receiving the word of God and writing out the scriptures, writing out the Old Testament, Moses and Isaiah and, and all these that, that wrote the Old Testament, David, there were false prophets among the people then. And it says, just as there were false prophets then, there'll be false teachers among you today. Okay, and it says, who, shall, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Now, that is a very strong phraseology. A heresy is, is something that creeps in and divides. Okay, um, when you talk about a heresy in a, in a block of wood, it's that check that begins down in the middle, and that's where you hit it with your axe, and it'll split. Okay, that's what a heresy is. And if you can picture that in the church, somebody coming in and sowing seeds of false doctrine that is meant to divide. Okay, that's, that's what this is alluding to. God himself said there will be those that will bring false teachings, that will go against his word. And we see that throughout the world today. Um, sadly, there are some good churches that are getting caught up in a lot of things that just seem 
it's status quo. It's what's been taught forever, but it's not what the word of God says. Okay. Um, and so you, your absolute is this Bible right here. It's not what I say. It's not what some other pastor says. It's not what brother Jeffrey says down in the Dominican. It's what the word of God says. Okay. This is his word. It's infallible, which means it, it can't be corrupted. Okay. Uh, Peter talks about it as being the incorruptible word of God. Uh, but it says, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift, swift destruction, and many shall follow their, follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth is evil spoken of. And what you're going to find today is when you teach true Bible Christianity, as the Bible says it, without works, without um, any, any will of man involved, without any, anything that we can do, that way of truth is going to be evil spoken of. Right, um, and then those those heresies come in, and there are things that divide churches, and those things that divide groups of people where they should be like minded, but the teachings of man have come in and divided. Now I will tell you this much: Jesus Christ came not to heal, but to bring a sword. Okay, He came to divide, and you'll find this. I've said this before. You'll find this any time you talk about Jesus Christ. There is a division that is made in the room. Okay, there are those that believe. And there are those that do not believe. And our belief and God's view of belief are two different things. Okay? The uh, Bible speaks very clearly. If thou believest in all thine heart, thou mayest. All right? This is Philip talking to the Ethiopian eunuch, asking, hey, can I get baptized? He says, if you believe in all your heart, then you may. And uh, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so that they baptized him there. It's that belief that God is looking for. And that is your choice. You choose to believe or you choose to stand in unbelief, okay? God has given us that. Adam chose to disbelieve, yeah, we use that word, disbelieve God's word, stand in unbelief against it, and follow the leading of his wife. And that is what led him to eat the fruit. Eve was deceived into it, okay? Men, that's why we have to protect our wives. It isn't that God made them lower than us, but he made them differently, our, we can look at a situation and we can think rationally. As I've said before, there are women who can think very clearly and very rationally under very stressful situations. And praise God for that. But that's not what they were originally designed to do. The ladies were designed to have that compassion and that, um, well, that motherly instinct. Okay? It's, it's just different. Men were fathers. We love our children. But we need to think rationally and not with our, not with our hearts. Okay? Because our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And if your heart is, this is interesting if you think about this. If your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, if your heart and Satan himself were to meet each other in a dark alley, Satan would take a knee and bow to your heart because it's more wicked and deceitful than he is. All things. Deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. How many times you hear in the secular world today, oh, just follow your heart. Right. Disney movies. (laughs) You know? It's the worst thing you can do. Now, what is your heart? I'm, I'm working on a, a trifold little thing like I've been putting out more about the inner man. What does God's word say about you on the inside? And I'm breaking down the mind, the heart, the spirit, the soul, and the reins. Those five things. Because those five things really control and direct you. Okay? Your heart, and I'll just summarize it very briefly, your heart is the part of you on the inside that speaks. Okay? I want you to, right now, uh, if you can, think of the lyrics of some song. Okay? Sing them in your heart. There is within my heart a melody. That's what came into my head, all right? So here's the thing. Their native tongue is Spanish, okay? Her heart speaks in Spanish. And so you know what language God speaks to her heart in? Spanish. You know what language God speaks to our heart in? English. And that's why he gave us an English Bible. 
okay? This is why you, I say you don't need the Greek and the Hebrew. Your heart doesn't speak Greek. Your heart doesn't speak Hebrew. He, it, it speaks in English. And we won't go into the depth of, of why this book that you hold in your hands is the perfectly preserved word of God, the perfect representation of those Old Testament and New Testament scriptures in English. But that's what it is, okay? And as it speaks to you, it is speaking to your heart. Okay, that's the part of you on the inside. Now, that heart will lie to you, but it doesn't lie all the time. And that's the problem with it. When someone is deceitful, it isn't that they lie all the time, but they slip in deceit here and there. And that's the danger. Somebody that lies all the time, you, you know they're going to be lying to you. You guys probably have guys at the plant that are like that. Okay? You just know it's an exaggeration. It's a lie. It's just truck drivers. Good night, right? Yeah, okay. Enough said. Not, not condemning the truck drivers at all, but it's just, it, it kind of comes with it. Okay? But then there are those that you can trust them, but they've lied to you before. And you don't know when they're telling the truth or when they're lying. And that's why your heart is so dangerous. Okay? Preaching of the word of God. It, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay? And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so that's why we preach the Bible here. That's why we preach the word of God. That's why we get into this thing, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Because it's through that that the word of God gets in you. If the word of God isn't being taught to you and preached to you, it's not going to do anything in you. Okay? God has given us everything that we need to believe him and be born again. He's given it all right here in this book. All right. Some of you, for a fact, know that you're lost. You know it. God has clearly shown it to you. This book will show you what you don't believe. Okay. God knows that there's something in your heart that is hidden way down. Maybe it's something that happened to you as a child. Maybe it's some bitterness you've built up. Maybe it's a, a hidden heart of rebellion. Whatever it is, it's hidden way down in there. But first, or yeah, first Corinthians 11, or no, not 11, excuse me. First Corinthians 14 says that when the preaching of the word of God is done, in, in there it, it says prophesying, okay? So when the prophesying of the word of God is being done, the declaring of the word of God, it says the secrets of the heart are made manifest, okay? You, got, you deal with truck manifests, right? Okay, what does it do? It tells you what's on that truck, Okay. That's what your Bible is telling you God does with preaching. It brings to the surface those things that are deep in your heart. Okay? You might think, boy, my mind, I just can't focus on anything tonight. The preaching is just going on, and, and I just keep having these thoughts, and I can't. This, this stuff in my childhood keeps coming up. Listen to that, because that is what God is showing you is in your heart, and that's who you are. You're that bitter little child who was hated. Or that's how you perceived it. You're that one that was abused. I'm telling you what, we, we have a lot of people in this church that were abused as children. Okay? It is way too common. Way too common. But those things will build up bitterness against God. It'll build up bitterness. God, why, did, why did God do this? He could have kept me from it. He could have taken me out of it. Well, that stuff happened so that you could see what was on the inside, so that you could see how wretched you were, so you could see you needed a Savior, so you could find that Savior in Jesus Christ. Okay? And the Word of God is for that. All right? And so Peter, back into 2 Peter, he's talking about all this. And then he goes into these different things about these, these false teachers and what they bring upon themselves and how God, uh, let's see here, verse 9, it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So there is a punishment coming. There is a judgment coming. And God is able to sift all that out and sort it all out. We worry about our country. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in America right now. But you've got to remember, God is able to sift all that out. That verse tells you right there, that ought to bring you great joy unless you fall in that area of unjust. Okay? And if not, you're not born again, that's you. He has reserved you to the day of judgment to be punished. Okay, we could go to Revelation 20. We can look at all that, but we won't tonight. Um,
But he goes on down through this, and uh, we looked at how their eyes, verse 14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. This is who these false teachers are. And they go in and they'll slip into houses and they'll subvert whole houses, leading captive silly women laden with sin. Okay, this is, this is the mindset of these ones, these deceivers. And one way you can know a deceiver is if they veer from this. Okay, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, they are. Because if you want to rephrase that a little bit, they're children of the curse. Okay? For by one man sinned and into the... <clears throat> they are the cursed children. Yeah. For by one man sin entered into the world, Adam, and death by sin. So death came upon all men, and for that, all have sinned. The proof that all have sinned is because that death comes upon all man. Okay? All of mankind will die someday. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. When you take your final breath on this earth, if you're born again, the next breath you'll be standing before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat, at your judgment seat. Okay? You have to give an account of all the things done in your body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. All right, we're gonna. Some will suffer loss. I believe all will suffer loss to a certain extent. Okay, um, for the unsaved, for those who aren't born again, those that don't have the inner witness of the Spirit of God in them, they will wake up in the flames of hell. Luke sixteen is very clearly explains that out. That rich man, Lazarus, was carried off to Abraham's bosom. That rich man woke up in the flames of hell crying out for just a drop of water from a filthy beggar's finger. You know, uh, that rich man is still there tonight. Next to probably some of those Pharisees that rejected Jesus Christ. And so this is, this is the heaviness of it. Okay, we, we talk about these false teachers and, and boy, when we've got it right, man, we can just get, I've got it right, don't I? And we've, joke about them. We make jokes about Joel Osteen and his big smile, that southern growl. But he's one of these cursed children. He needs Jesus Christ. He does not have the God of this Bible. And it's, it's very easy to see that with the Jesus that he preaches. But sadly, there are, there are men that stand in Baptist pulpits who are lost. I know because I was one of those for about five years. Two years after I thought I got saved, I started preaching. And it wasn't until five years after that that God actually broke me, showed me what I was on the inside. And it was on the way to work. I was going into work midnights at the plant. And it was about maybe 10 minutes after 10. And God just opened my heart and showed me the blackness and the wickedness that was on the inside. And to make matters worse, and he showed me the righteousness of Jesus. I didn't see a 50-foot Jesus, you know, in front of my car. That, that stuff doesn't happen. If you hear somebody tell you that, let it go in one ear and write out the other. Because this Bible says that he manifests his word through preaching. And that his son is manifested through the preaching of the word of God. Okay, that's how we see Jesus Christ today. But I, I had heard preaching for all those years, and he finally, he finally smote me and showed me what I was. And he broke me. And when I thought it couldn't get any worse, then he showed me Jesus Christ, and I, I literally died in his presence. There, there was no hope for me, and I knew it. And across my mind flashed the words, my grace is sufficient. And for the first time, I finally believed it. I finally believed that that grace that I had heard about out of this book was sufficient to cover everything that God had just shown me. But I had to become a worm and no man first. Okay, and we're going to look at that scripture tonight later on. All right. Yeah, we'll have time. Amen. All right. Well, this has been all review. All right. Back into this. Verse 17. Any, any comments on that real quick before we continue on? Any questions at all? No. All right. Verse 17. It says, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. And there's that, those two words, forever. Okay. And looking at that, that mist of darkness, there is a special darkness preserved for false teachers. 
It's reserved for them. And it will have, there will be a special mist of darkness for them because of what they do in leading others astray. Okay? This is why if you're going to stand and preach and teach the word of God, you had best know what you're doing. And you had better know that you have the mind of Christ on that stuff. Uh, James, I think it is, tells us, be not many masters, for we'll fall into the greater condemnation. I don't know if that, is that James? I can't remember right offhand. I think it is. But these wells without water, think about this. Let's, let's put our, ourselves in the mind of a, uh, an Israelite wandering through the wilderness. Those waters of Meribah, does that ring a bell at all? Those bitter waters, Israel had been wandering and they come upon these waters and, and they were running out of water and then the, finally the water they get to, all of a sudden it's bitter, they can't even drink it. And they get bitter against God. And God brings judgment upon them and, and all of this. And, and we see in samples, we see pictures of what we should be looking out for in our own lives. Okay? You may be asking for something. You may be seeking God on something. And when he, you finally get there, it's not what you expected it to be. Don't let that sow bitterness in your heart because God knows better what you need. There, there's a whole picture of uh, you know, Moses throwing in the tree and, and that bitterness making of, of that, that tree going in that bitter water, it made it sweet. Okay. Mara. What did I say? It's the same thing. Oh, you're right. You're right. Meribah is where he smote the rock instead of spoke to it. All right, so the waters of Mara. Yeah. No, that's why she's my help, meat for me. Perfectly fitting. Yep. Yeah. All right, so at any rate, the waters of Mara, thank you. It means bitter. Um, that tree got thrown in there, and that tree is a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to spiritualize this a little bit. You know me, I don't usually spiritualize things. But if you have bitterness, get to the cross of Jesus Christ and see what you've done to Jesus is infinitely worse than what that person did to you. I'm preaching myself here tonight, okay? All right, and so at any rate... But you're wandering through the wilderness and you're, you're going many, many miles and you know that there is a well of water at this location. You've passed by it many times. It's 20 miles out and you know when I get there, I can restock my water and I'll be able to get to the final destination. So you're going and going and going through this wilderness. Nobody around for miles and you finally get there and the, water is, the well is dry. Okay, That's what these false teachers are. Right? They will lead and lead and lead and bring no healing waters. Okay? One way you can test to see if the preaching of the word of God is true or not, what's it doing to your heart and what's it doing to the people's hearts that are listening to it? Is there any change being wrought in those people? Now, God has to circumcise your ears. He has to cut away the flesh of your ears so that you can hear his word. Okay, But... If he gives you ears to hear, your heart will be stirred in you. You'll know that there's something different about this. There, there, this hurts more than it should. Why, why does this hurt so badly? It's because it's the word of God and it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. This book, when you open it up and when it is preached to you, you're not discerning it. It is discerning your thoughts in your heart, and it's discerning the intents of your heart. What do you intend by those thoughts? Okay? You may have thoughts in your heart, and you think that you're doing well, but you're doing it for your own selfish gain. Okay? God's word can discern that, and he'll make it manifest to you, and he'll smite you with it. Okay? And so looking at this stuff here, this is, this is, a, this is a hard thing. These are, these are very hard, harsh words, but this is how much God cares about good doctrine. Right. The Bible calls it sound doctrine. When something is sound, it's solid and it's firm. Okay? Uh, a sound mind is one that has an absolutely firm foundation in Jesus Christ. Okay? Other than that, you have no foundation and you're a double-minded man, and you're unstable in all of your ways. Right. Now, verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, 
Through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Now, we're going we're gonna to get into that in just a second. But this word wantonness, this is connected to your will, okay? Can anybody define wantonness for me? Anybody use that in a sentence lately? Okay. Now, this is what's called early modern English, all right? 1611 was a time of early modern English. It was the height of the English language, the spoken English language, okay? The written English language had yet a couple hundred years to mature, okay, in spelling, punctuation, font, all of that, okay? We had, there's a great history of the King James Bible from 1611 to present, okay? But looking at this here, this wantonness, it, it has, I, I wrote down, and it's real, real small, so I've got to look, get closer. My eyes are getting older. Um, okay, I'm going I'm to define the word iniquity because I'm going to use this as a definition. Iniquity is lawlessness in your heart, okay? Lawlessness in your heart is like you don't care if it's a law of man. You don't care if it's a law of God. You're going to do what you want to. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. David also talked about them as being presumptuous sins, okay? Uh, it's not a sin of ignorance. It isn't that you didn't know any better. You knew better, and you did it anyway, okay? That's iniquity. And so this wantonness, it's, it's rebellious. It's, it's iniquitous, okay? It has lawlessness involved in it. And it also is connected to inciting lustfulness, inciting somebody into lust, Okay, whether it be a sexual lust, whether it be a, another lust of the flesh. Um, and Paul said, I wouldn't have known lust except the law said, thou shalt not covet. Right there, the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. Okay? That was where Paul's heart was smitten. He said, as touching the law, I was blameless. If, if you could do it on that law and everything else involved, I understand the law is much more than just the 10 commandments. But if you could do it or touch it, God said he was blameless. He let him put that in the Bible, that he was blameless before God. Now, until he got to the 10th commandment, and that's where the pricks hit his heart. Okay, uh, when, when Saul the Pharisee, who later became Paul, met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, after Jesus had died, after he had risen from the dead, Saul the Pharisee was wreaking havoc of the church as a very zealous Pharisee, trying to stamp out this whole thing, this new thing of Jesus Christ. And Jesus finally stopped him in his tracks and said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And what was happening was every time he would hear the word of God preached and every time he would read the law, and he knew the law perfectly, every time he would do that, he would see that thou shalt not covet, and it would prick his heart. And it was getting harder and harder and harder for him to kick against it. And finally, God stopped him in his tracks and said, that's enough. And he saved him that day. That's the power of God. Amen. A man like that. Okay? If we want to uh, put it in a modern day perspective, think about Adolf Hitler. All of a sudden, becoming the world's greatest advocate for the Jews. Okay? That's the type of turnaround that Jesus Christ can make in somebody. That's the Jesus Christ of this King James Bible. A Jesus Christ that can break free from addiction. He doesn't just set you free. This Bible says he makes you free. It's a creative act. It's something that wasn't there before and all of a sudden is. You were in bondage unto sin, and, and we're going to look at that when we get to verse 19. But you were in bondage unto sin until Jesus Christ made you free. And from there, you are a servant unto righteousness. Okay? The Jesus Christ that is preached today can't do that because all that he does is he, he might maybe save you as long as you, you know, feel really bad about your sin and, and, and you pray this quick prayer, then you'll be saved. And it doesn't matter if your life doesn't change. You just remember, though, that moment when you prayed to ask Jesus to save you. You won't find that anywhere in this Bible. There is no place in this Bible where somebody came to a point where they prayed a prayer to receive Jesus Christ for salvation. It's not in here. Okay? Um, go through the whole thing. Paul never did it, Peter never did it, James never did it, John never did it, Jesus Christ never did it, none of the prophets ever did it, nobody. So what is salvation? It's finding a person by the name of Jesus Christ and finding him and believing that he is the Son of God 
and that God has raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. Lord willing, we're going to look at that tonight. All right. Um, but they lure through uh, the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. All right. Remember, that's connected with their will. It is their will to draw these people away and to feed off of their lusts and to use that to draw them into sin and away from the true word of God. Uh, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Now, I want to go to eight, John 8, 34 real quick. Keep your place here, but go to John chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, fourth book in the New Testament. John chapter 8. And verse 34, Jesus Christ himself says this. Verse 34 says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, there's a difference between a servant and a slave. Your King James Bible, you will use the word slave two times, only twice. Okay? A slave has absolutely no rights has absolutely no choice, has absolutely no power over their own life whatsoever. But you are a servant to sin. Okay? There's a difference between a slave and a servant. A servant has rights. A servant has a choice. Now, they serve a master, and they're to serve him uh, without question, faithfully. But a servant is not a slave. All right, now look at this. I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Uh, go to Romans chapter 6 now. Keep that verse in mind. Go to Romans chapter 6. Whosoever, is the servant, or whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Romans 6, starting at verse 16, says this. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So whoever you yield your members, all right? What are your, what are your members? Yourselves. What is that? That's your body. That's you. Whatever you yield yourself to, whatever you, you bow to in submission, you are that things servant, whether it's of sin unto death, remember, sin brought death, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, okay? So obedience will bring you unto righteousness. Sin will bring you unto death. The soul that sinneth it shall die. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die, okay? That is a very clear command, and it applies to both Christians and and unsaved folk, all right? If a Christian decides they're not going to follow God anymore and they're going to live after the flesh, God will take them out prematurely. He will kill them. That is a biblical truth. This is the righteous and holy God that we serve, and that is out of love for his child. What kind of a love would it be if my son was being disobedient and he was going off into the world and doing wicked things and I saw where it was going to take him and I knew what the outcome was going to be and I just took my hands off and said, well, I love him, so I'm not going to do anything. That's no love at all. Watch him destroy his life in drugs and fornication and in wickedness. That's not love at all. And so God will chastise his children and he will bring them back around. But we saw earlier this year a young man, 22 years old, I think it was. I won't name the name because this is going to go on the internet, but we had his funeral here. And it was a very, very sad thing. He died because of drunk driving. He was living after the flesh, and he died. It's the word of God being played out. And then some might get angry at God. Why, God? Why did you take him from us? If you live after the flesh, he shall die. This is the way the word of God works. We get warnings in this thing. We get, we get uh, uh, chastisement in it. We, we see ourselves in it. And we wonder, what, why is all of this happening? And then all of a sudden a verse pops out at you. Oh, that's why that's happening. Okay. 
Let's continue looking at this, though. Verse 17 in Romans chapter 6. Yeah, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. You see that? It doesn't say set free. It says made free. When you are born again, when God Almighty comes down and has salvation wrought in you, you are made a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God takes away those addictions. God, and he might not do it right off the bat. There are some things that, man, they'll, they'll clear right up out of, your, out of your life immediately. There are some things that are, go a little deeper. And we talk about this as being the difference between the fruit and the root. Okay? When you think about... Uh, that's a fly. When you think about uh, sin, the word S-I-N, that is your nature, okay? That is the root in you before you're born again, okay? That is what you were born with. That is who you are. That is what you are. What The things that your life that you do, that's not sin. That's the fruit of that sin nature. The words you say, the evil imaginations you have in your heart, the lustful thoughts that run through your mind, the wickedness that comes out, the, the fornication, the adultery, the, the, the wantonness, okay? All of that. And again, fornication, for, if you're not familiar, the word fornication literally means any sexual act before marriage. Outside of that, before there is a marriage covenant, it's any sexual act. And seeing in, in Matthew chapter five, when Jesus Christ equates Lusting after a woman in your heart with adultery before you're married, that fornication is any lustful act alone or with somebody. Okay, that's fornication. All right? God says it, it is the only sin that a man commits against his own body. Now, adultery is a, the only sin a man commits against his own soul, man or woman. Okay? But fornication is a sin against your own body. It is dangerous. It is destructive. And it, it, will, it will destroy you from the inside out. It will remove that natural affection that God has given you. And that's why you see, and it's so sad to see, and it breaks my heart. All you got to do is stand in line at Walmart and watch some of these women that have little children. And there's no love there. And they're covered in tattoos and their hair's all different colors and they're covered in piercings because why? Because they're trying to find an identity. They don't know who they are. They've been hurt and wounded so bad so many times. They've given their heart away to so many different men. And it's like a piece of tape. I've used this example before. You can only put a piece of tape on a wall and pull it off so many times before it loses its stick. Okay? And this is like a man or woman that fornicates and fornicates and fornicates and fornicates and man and woman and man and woman and man and woman and sometimes both at the same time. And just that perversion. And it, they lose their natural affection. So when God finally does give them children, they don't love them. But can I tell you, remembering that verse that Paul says, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. That natural affection can be restored by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it with my own eyes. A woman who was an adulteress and a whore, loving her children, loving her husband. Okay? That is what Jesus Christ does in somebody. Amen. But you don't hear that today. That's right. Instead, it's spiritualized preaching to try to help you get over the things and the the, uh, the effects of the sin in your life. That's the majority of preaching out there. But this is what the foolishness of preaching does. It brings the word of God as a sharp sword and pierces, and it hurts. This stuff is not comfortable. I understand it hurts. But this is what the word of God is for. That's why it's the most important thing at this church. Okay. Now, um, where was I going with all of that? Sin. Okay, so sin. The word sins in your Bible is not the plural for sin, okay? What it is is it's the fruit of that sin nature, okay? Think about the difference between a tree and an apple, okay? An apple tree would be equated to sin. The apples on the apple tree are equated to sins, 
It's the fruit. It's what comes off of it. An apple tree will produce apples. An orange tree will produce oranges. A mango tree will produce mangoes. Okay? Oh, yeah. They love mangoes, yeah. <laughs> Unless there's grafting, of course, but we're not getting into all that for the illustration, okay? Uh, but when you look at that and you find a sin in your life and you say, wow, I just cannot stop lying. I just can't stop exaggerating. And by the way, exaggeration is lying. Okay? If it goes beyond what is true, I don't care how good it makes the story sound, it is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Okay? Let's all take that into account. Amen and amen. Amen. And so, evangelists, oh, good night. So, at any rate, um, but lying, I just can't stop lying. Well, that's the fruit. Let's travel down the branch, the, off the twig, down the branch, down the trunk, and then you get underground where you can't see, and then all of a sudden you start finding the root of that. And that, that root of that lying may be rooted in bitterness and feeling unwanted and feeling like your life doesn't measure up. And so you have to constantly lie to make it seem better. And what that is, is a, a discontentment with what God has given you. And so you are angry at God, and that's why you lie. Okay? Let's, let's use an example here. I've used this in the church many times. By now, the people that are familiar with it are like, oh, not this one again. But let's listen. Let's say a man wants to steal a car. And so in the process of stealing this car, he shoots somebody and kills them. The police start chasing him, evades police, he causes all sorts of accidents and stuff, and somebody else dies in the process, and they finally capture the guy, and, and he even still resists arrest and all this, and they throw him in jail. And when it's finally his turn to stand before the judge, and he reads off all of the charges, okay, grand theft auto, murder, first degree murder, second degree manslaughter, uh, evading police, you know, resisting arrest, all of these various charges that would come up on him. What was the worst thing of all that? In our minds, we say it's the murder. Okay? Uh, in our minds, that makes the most sense. But let's look at this. He never would have killed anybody if he hadn't stolen the car. All right? So, wow. So, stealing the car was the root cause of that murder. But why did he steal the car? Number 10, he wanted something that God hadn't given him, and he was discontent with what he had. And he felt like he deserved to have that. And so it consumed him to the point of stealing the car, killing the person, and all the other things that came from it. The root of those sins was covetousness. And Paul said, if the law had not said, thou shalt not covet, I would have never known lust. Okay. So there's a, there's a good equating word in our minds. I believe all of us in here understand what lust is. Some of us do. Maybe the younger ones not so much. But they understand wanting things that isn't theirs. But lust is covetousness. Okay. Husbands, you're not to lust after your wife. You're to love your wife. Jesus Christ did not lust after his church. He loves his church. Okay. There's a difference. There's a big difference. So, back in Romans uh, chapter 6. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So God is making us free from sin, from the root cause of everything in our lives. Every terrible thing, every hard thing, every wicked thing, all the, the addictions and the perversion and everything in your life Jesus Christ can make you free from that. And there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to deserve it. Except believe. It's the choice to believe what God wrote. That's what will do it. Now, um, I was going to read another couple of verses, but let's go back to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, verse 19 again, while they promised them liberty, 
They themselves are the servants of corruption. And if you're keeping track, verse 18 matches up with Jude, verse 16. Verse 19 matches up with Jude, verse 4. Okay, we had started looking at these different things. If you want to jot those in, check them out later, you can. Um, matches up absolutely word for word perfect. I think Peter and Jude were in the same room when they wrote the thing. Okay, there's no stupid question. But it says those that were clean Right. From them, they were clean escaped from them that live in error. They had, they were clean escaped. They had gotten themselves out of that wicked crowd. Those that live in error, they had gotten themselves out. Just like God had to take Israel out of Egypt so that he could give them the law in the wilderness, so that he could teach them his word, give them the tabernacle, give them that picture of Jesus Christ. He has to take somebody out of Egypt, out of their own wickedness, and get them to the place where they can see God. Uh, we heard testimony uh, last Friday night, it was, of the girl that um, in 2020, in June, of, or June or July of 2020, there was some meetings up at Black Creek Baptist Church. And at that meeting, this, this girl and her husband were absolute flat-out al- alcoholics, their son would come to the church and, and Wednesday nights he would pray every single Wednesday. Ask, will you pray that my mommy and daddy will stop drinking? Every Wednesday. Got to the point where the people were actually expecting it and sadly some were getting annoyed by it. And it's like, oh, here we go again. But guess what? In June of 2020, God took that from them. They didn't drink another drop of alcohol after that night. Stopped. Now they, they weren't saved. But what happened? He got them to a place. He brought them out of Egypt so their minds could be clear. So their minds could think clearly. If you've ever had any dealings with alcohol, you understand what it does to you. You cannot think clearly. It takes away all inhibitions and you do things that you normally wouldn't do. Actually, you do the things that are in your heart because it just takes the stop out. Okay? Whatever you would do, drunk, that's what's in your heart. Oh, I was just, that was just the alcohol. No, that was your wicked, fornicating heart. That's what that was. But after that night, they didn't drink another drop of alcohol. And at our missions conference in October, so this was June, July, August, September, October, four months later, they were seeking God with everything that they had. And I believe it was Thursday night, Was it Thursday night of our missions conference? Chelsea got saved. But God had to bring her out of Egypt so that she could clearly seek God. This isn't work salvation because it's nothing you can do. But if you, the Bible talks about drawing nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. That word nigh is important in your King James Bible because it means so much more than near. Okay, a lot of us are familiar with this, but listen. Nigh means that there's absolutely nothing between you and God. Right now, let's look at this. Right now, there's a pulpit, my Bible, my phone, this microphone, my son, Miss Lois, and then there's my wife. In relation to Smithport, I'm near my wife, locationally. But there's a lot of stuff in between us. Now watch this. We're going to keep it rated Song of Solomon, so don't worry about it. Amen. Um, but that's, that's the difference. I moved around everything else and got everything else out of the way so I could be nigh unto my wife. God tells you to draw nigh unto him. That means there's things in your life that he has pointed his finger at and said, this is separating me and you. You know what that, se- that thing is that separate? Isaiah said it's our iniquities that had separated us between us and our God. Okay? Again, that lawlessness in your heart. You know it's wrong, but you do it anyway. Those things that in your will you choose to do. God says get that out of the way. When you get those things out of the way, he says, I'll draw nigh unto you. Which means there's things that God will then move out of the way. 
There's some things we can move, and that's us drawing nigh. But then God has to draw nigh because there's some more things that he, only he can move. One of those things for Chelsea was her drinking. God moved that out of her way. Exactly. Yeah, there, there will be things that we don't even know about. And we'll be sitting and preaching. All of a sudden, something will come up and it'll, sh- it'll just, I didn't even realize that was in my heart. And then God just takes it. Okay, that's him drawing nigh unto you. But you've got to be under the preaching to have that happen. That's, that's why it's, it's through the foolishness of preaching. My job description is foolishness. Jeffrey, on a business card, you could have fool. <laughs> it's Pastor Phil. But, <laughs> right. All right. But that's that, that clean escape. They were clean escaped from those that live in error. They quit running with that bar crowd. They quit running with that ungodly friend. They quit living that life of fornication or adultery. They got themselves out as best they could so that God could then clean their mind up and bring them unto himself. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Therefore let us labor to enter into that rest. The difference between work and labor is work changes things. But labor is just plain labor. It's just that continual working of that soil, that continual laboring in those fields. A farmer will will clear a plot of land, then he'll plow it, then he'll fertilize it, then he'll plant the seed. And then he waits, and God does the work by making that seed grow. Okay, But if that farmer didn't get out there, if he just said, oh, I'm just waiting for God to do it all, all the while sitting there doing his own thing. That's that, that seed that sits in that sack, it might grow only because of the moisture in the sack, and it might grow there, but it's never going to bring forth fruit. Certainly not in a spiritual sense. Certainly not going to bring forth fruit unto salvation. That cleansing of the life, that's not going to. That's why we labor. What is the labor that we do? We get to church. We get under the preaching any chance we can. We read the Word of God. We meditate on the Word of God. Yeah, Sean. Just, I know you've said it before, and, and I just explain that, why the Bible uses that term, foolishness. Foolishness. Okay. Um, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, foolishness. But to us who are saved is the power of God. Okay, Thank you. okay? that's why. It's foolishness to the lost world. Honestly, if you were to ask the world in general, Thursday night at 725. Yeah, by the way, we're not getting into the Old Testament tonight. Okay. Next week. Um, 725, why are you here? Listen to this kid with gray hair. Go on and on about this stuff. Well, it's the foolishness of preaching that saved them that believe. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not, now, by the way, that's not by the listening of the word of God. There's a difference between listening and hearing. When you're standing out in the woods, think about this. When you're standing out in the woods, and something catches your ear, there's a noise. All of a sudden, you stop. You bend your ear, and you're, you're really trying to listen. You're listening real hard. You're trying to even calm your breathing so it's dead silent. And then all of a sudden, that sound catches your ear again. And you hear it. There's a difference between listening and hearing. When you come, don't just listen to the Word of God. Hear the Word of God. But in the Old Testament, I mean, we could go into Isaiah and I could show you where the Israelites had, had stopped their ears, put their hands right over them. Uh, in the New Testament, it talks about uh, in the last days, perilous times shall come, where men will be lovers of themselves and uh, covetous and blasphemers and all of this. Uh, and it says, heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, when your ear itches inside, what do you do? You go like this. When you're doing that, you can't hear anything. Okay. And you don't want to hear the preaching because it hurts and it brings up things that you don't like. But that's where God needs to take you to in order to show you what you are inside 
in order so that you can fall under condemnation. All right, the whole purpose of this right here, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Until the law of God pierces your heart and shows your guiltiness before God, that you are all of those. Not that you've done all of those. And you're guilty against all of those, but all of those things is what makes you, you. And you become a worm and no man. That's when Jesus Christ is then eye to eye with you. Because he became a worm and no man. The king of glory. The creator of the entire universe who spoke it all into existence. That was Jesus Christ on creation day. Let there be light. He is the one that created it. You look at that narrative in Genesis chapter 1. That is the voice of Jesus Christ speaking everything into existence. And in the same way, when you finally believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And everything that that entails... A lot of you may believe it up here because you've heard it before. But there's a corner of your heart that does not believe. There's a corner of your heart that still is is holding out in unbelief. There's still a part of you that just refuses to believe. And maybe you can't even see it. Maybe you need to draw nigh unto God. And he'll draw nigh unto you. Just be ready for it when he does because... It's painful. It's very painful. But oh, it's good. It's good because then the grace and the peace comes flooding in. Mm. I'm telling you what, if you're, if you're looking at your life and, and you have what we'd like to call a profession of faith. You know, I, I, at six years old, I, I prayed and asked Jesus to save me. So that's my profession of faith. I, I profess that I have faith in this Jesus. But no change has been wrought in your life. Okay, well, six years old, well, I mean, what is there? I know a lot of very rebellious six-year-olds, okay? But look at your life. Does it match up what this book says a saved person lives like? Well, how do we know what that is? It's all through it. But if you want to really know what a saved person, somebody who has had salvation wrought by God in them, they've passed from death unto life, they were made a new creature, They have been not only covered by the blood of Jesus, they have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And that's the difference. The Old Testament covered sin. Jesus' blood washes it completely away. It couldn't do anything as pertaining to the conscience. Hebrews tells us that. That old covenant, it could not. The blood of bulls and goats, it couldn't do anything as pertaining to the conscience. That's why David said in Psalm 51, my sin is ever before me. He couldn't clear his conscience of this thing. But the blood of Jesus Christ will. It will clear your conscience. It says it will purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. There's another sign. Do you have a desire to serve God? Beyond your wanting to help out or beyond your moral obligation or beyond, well, if I don't, my family might think this or I mean, you start going through all these things. Read through, read through 1 John. It'll show you all throughout there. What are the pictures of what a Christian should look like? Somebody who has been born again. It's in 1 John, all throughout. Okay? Um, if you need some, something to study, there's, there's a good place to study. Uh, oh, let's see. But yeah, we'll, we'll end at 18. Man, we got through two verses tonight. Glory to God. Woo! We really made some, uh, made some progress. But yeah, those, those that were clean escape from them that lived in error, those are those that have come up out of that. All right? We'll pick up on that thought next week, and we'll go into the rest here. Yeah, Carlene. Oh, uh, okay, so verse 18 matches up with Jude. Verse 16, it's almost the exact same wording. And then verse 19 matches up with Jude 4. And I guess maybe for the sake of the recording, I might just read them. Verse 18 says this, uh, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they lure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them that who live in error. Jude 16 says this, These murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts and speaking their mouth, 
uh, and, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Okay? And then verse 19 says this, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of a whom a man is overcome, the same is he brought into bondage. And Jude 4 says this, For there were certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now that wantonness, another word for it is lasciviousness. Okay? And lasciviousness is living in such a way that you're stirring up lust in other people. Okay? We live in a very lascivious culture. TikTok is lasciviousness. Okay? It doesn't take long in the scrolling on TikTok for that lasciviousness to come up. Okay? That's not even the worst of it. Uh, but lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, all through uh, chapter two here, you see Jude coming out in this stuff. And um, read, read the book of Jude, his letter, and then read Second Peter chapter two in correlation, and you'll find the sa- almost the same exact wording in throughout the whole thing. So, any other questions before we close out tonight? Statements, anything that's God stirred up in you? No. Nope. All right, brother Jeffrey, you wanna? Pray for us tonight. Sure, sure. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that on a Thursday night we can be gathered together, Lord, on your word. We thank you for the power of it, Lord, how mm. your Holy Spirit uses it uh, just to bring up uh, those areas in our lives that need to be changed so that we can be more like Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for the power of it as well. And uh, we're so thankful that it's not just this book, this is just give us doctrine, but uh, but it gives us instruction, Lord, mm. how to get it right. And I pray for, for those that perhaps, Lord, may be lost and need to get saved. I pray that they'll go to the scriptures. Yes. And see that they can get saved and that Jesus wants them to be saved. And for those that perhaps are saved and uh, perhaps sin is having control over their lives, that they realize that they've been made for you. Yes, Lord. And they don't have to turn back to that bondage of sin, Lord, mm. that you already rescued us from. And uh, just thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for uh, just your love and your mercy. For even before time began, you knew that we were going to choose sin, Lord. And, and in spite of that, you loved us and died for us uh, to give us this great opportunity to be called the sons of God, to be able to have fellowship with you. And uh, just thank you, Lord, for this uh, wonderful privilege to be able to talk to you and hear your voice uh, through your word, Lord. Thank you so much. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.